I'm so excited that the Sri Lanka Foundation has decided to bring this beautiful event to City Hall this year in Centennial Park. The people at the Tournament of Roses are getting very nervous about whether this, uh, this parade is going to outgrow that, that event that they have on the 1st of January. We're delighted to have you here. We enjoy your celebration and we hope to see you here for many years to come. Thank you very much. This is the second time we are actually having it here in Pasadena. But the turnout was pretty good given the fact that today was like, you know, a really hot day. We had an amazing turnout here. By just taking a, a little survey walking around that we have more non-Sri Lankans than we've ever had before. Do you know how many Sri Lankans were involved this year to volunteer their time? 100? I hear 100 going once. Uh, guy here, 300 in the back. Well, it was well over 300 people volunteering their time today. When they landed from India 2,500 years ago, they came with the land flag, Sri Lanka. The two stripes, one of them is for the Tamil people who are in Sri Lanka now, 10% of the people, 10, 15%. The other one is, all the other one is put together, green color. So they put the two stripes after we got the independence. Although it was just a lion flag. Now lion flag with two stripes to add on the minorities. Dr. Walter Jai Singh founded the foundation. The foundation has been really helpful because he has been promoting the Sri Lankan culture, the arts, the crafts, the uh, dances as you may have witnessed today, the food. We are eating like uh, chicken curry, fish curry and uh, you know fried tomato curry and uh, uh, we are making a special thing for the chili paste. Now, hoppers eating like a morning and dinner. It's a re really light. I wake up like a three o'clock and I prepare everything. I cut it everything and uh, you know marinate yesterday night and I cook today. I really like how Sri Lankans are very like involved and we made our own little community in Los Angeles. So every year we have a, a festival like this. So it gives a uh, Los Angeles the ability to see what the Sri Lankan culture is about. You guys would have been able to witness like some awesome, awesome, like gorgeous models up there modeling the Sri Lankan style. Uh, saris, they were wearing them and most of them were like actually, you know, uh, done by Sri Lankan designers and they were flown from there to here so that uh, we could uh, showcase it amongst all these uh, different cultures so that they get to witness the beautiful attire that we kind of wear back home. And mostly, I mean, when it comes to the Sri Lankans, we wear this attire for functions, um, especially like the Candian attire is like symbolical and uh, brides do wear it. Uh, and there's no specific color to that. Again, it depends on your liking. So people would go ahead and make beautiful, colorful attire. In different events, you would see different styles pretty much coordinated. Oh, it means a lot to say, you know, to have uh, the interaction between the United States with culture. So I think it's a great thing. We try to put people together. And this is one of those events. You'll find in the parade, you get a, a Catholic school having a grotto. And you find the Muslim people with a float and the Muslim mosque. The Buddhist people with a float, with the Buddhist stupas. You know, you get everything. So it, it, it brings together a unity. Astrofest is an opportunity for the organizations of the City of Astronomy to share their love of science and discovery with the Pasadena public. We've got virtual reality demos, and then we also have robotics demos. There are student STEM leaders here exhibiting alongside the organizations. Um, so we've got the San Marino Robotics team demoing a robot that they built. PCC also has brought their Swarmathon robots. We have also got the Westridge rocketry team. We've also got solar observing. We have eight different telescopes coming to set up for evening stargazing. Pasadena really is the center of astronomy and astrophysics research in the world. Uh, it started here in 1904 with George Ellery Hale, who came and founded the Carnegie Observatories and Mount Wilson. So our activity here is that we have a portable planetarium. It's a movable planetarium. We can fit about 25 people on it at once. 
and then we can show light shows and we can show basically the constellations. You can also show trips through the universe and planets and things of that sort. In most sciences, you can go into a laboratory and you can do an experiment. Astronomy, we can't really do that, right? We only have what the universe sends us, and that, for the most part, is light. So here we are on Earth, and yet we're studying things that are, in some cases, 13 billion light years away. And of course, astronomy is really about understanding our place in the universe, which is something I think everybody's very interested in. We are a student-run team. Every year, we have to build a robot according to a certain task that we have to do. This year, we had to pick up these one-foot-by-one-foot milk crates and also climb a rope. We have our robot from last year which had to pick up a crate and put it onto a seven foot scale. And we have also built a t-shirt cannon. When someone joins our team they do not need to have any experience. Seniors who are more experienced teach the freshmen and by the time the freshmen become seniors they are very experienced and they are able to teach everyone else and all the freshmen. We're a part of a national competition called TARC, Team America Rocketry Challenge. Our rockets have to reach a certain height goal and a time goal. We're showing our past rockets, both our rockets that have failed, but also our rockets that have made it to nationals. We're just trying to show our engineering process in creating the different rockets. We are here all day actually, until tonight at 10 p.m. So we, are, we will be able to observe the, the sky and planets. Tonight we will be uh, observing Saturn. Uh, Jupiter and the moon. These are called uh, Swarmathon rovers. We're going to eventually send a whole bunch of these rovers over to Mars as scouts. We're going to have these tiny robots that are very cheap and they're going to be going around searching for resources and bringing them back. Kind of like how ants do it. NASA sent us these rovers so we're going to work on the software. We're going to make them autonomous. It takes about 15 minutes to send a signal to Mars, another 15 minutes for a signal to be sent back. So we're hoping to eliminate that by autonomizing the robots. Our job is to support NASA infrared missions, and we, um, in particular, are, have been talking today about the Spitzer Space Telescope and the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer telescopes that observe in the infrared. So we have set up here an infrared camera, and the kids have ice where they can see how infrared helps you detect the temperature of things. They have also been learning about how infrared light is different than the light they can see with their eyes. Our goal in outreach is to get the next generation excited about all science, all STEM subject matter. Today we're focusing more on astronomy, so the idea is to get the families and the kids out and, and show the kids that these are really cool things that they could aspire to work on themselves. We had designed a project where they would measure out the distance of the different planets from the sun to represent how big our solar system is and how the planets are in relation to that. One other fun activity we created or that we have here today it, uh, demonstrates angular momentum. We're building in the uh, Atacama Desert in Chile, which is one of the preferred places on the Earth to observe the heavens. Very dry, very smooth airflow, uh, and we're building one of the world's largest telescopes there. What you see behind us is a holographic projection, so it gives you an, op an opportunity to see in three dimensions what the telescope in the observatory looks like. Our telescope is built around seven of the world's largest mirrors. Each of these mirrors is 8.4 meters in diameter. And when we have all seven of those mirrors uh, in the telescope, well, the telescope's about 10 times the size of the Hubble Space Telescope. We have a miniature version of our historic 100-inch telescope where Edwin Hubble actually discovered the universe. And we also have some of the historical pictures, such as when Einstein went up there to visit. This is a picture of Orion's Nebula, taken with our 60-inch telescope back in 1908. It was a three-hour exposure. A lot of people are very impressed with our miniature model of the 100 inch because it's literally made of paper. Uh, at this table over here, we're making space buttons. So we're actually going through old copies of our Planetary Report magazine and picking up beautiful pictures. We're exhibiting some of the programs and projects that the Planetary Society is involved in. The uh, light sail, that's a, a, a model of a bread box size satellite that we send up into space which will deploy a mylar sail and actually use sunlight to push it through space. We also have a prototype, something we call Planet Back, and this is going to be attached to the leg of a landing vehicle on another planet or world, and it will actually suck up some of the soil, put it into a container, and either do tests on it there on the planet, or possibly have it come back to Earth in a, in a sample return mission. One of the things that we try to do is get people to participate in space exploration. We are all connected to space. We have an exhibit here 
teaching people about planets orbiting other stars, or exoplanets. We know now of more than 3,000 planets orbiting other stars of all sizes, orbiting all sorts of stars, and we're here today talking about one way that we find those planets and understand more about their atmospheres. The way that we do this is by investigating the different colors of light that pass through the atmospheres of these stars. Trappist is a it's dwarf star, it's pretty close to the Earth, and the scientists find out about seven planets around. This particular one E is in a so-called habitable zone, which means that it's not too far from its parent star, it's not too close, it's not too warm, it's not too hot. Potentially, there could be life on there, just like our Earth. This is a globe of Jupiter celebrating the Juno spacecraft. Uh, Juno has been orbiting Jupiter since 2016. Juno is just focused on Jupiter for the first time. And so they're gonna try to figure out what's going on on the inside. And the better we understand Jupiter, the better we understand uh, how other planets in the solar system formed. And right there is Venus and, and dim Jupiter. If even just one kid uh, starts today and then goes off with memories and has a positive feeling about science and goes to pursue a career in science, I think we'll be successful. Today we're hosting this press conference to announce new electric vehicle incentives that will help power up Pasadena. The SEED program by our Department of Transportation and CalSTART, which will help consumers test electric vehicles without having to spend any money in advance. EVs help improve local air quality, they help reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, global warming, and in turn provide an opportunity for all of us and the future generations to have a better quality of life. The push is so important right now because we're just at that point now where the, the sales of electric vehicles are taking off. In fact, in California, the sales are now pushing about 5% of new car sales. But if people don't see infrastructure out there, it's going to be a, not a very good experience. You wouldn't buy a gasoline car if you never saw a gas station. So even though most charging is done in the home, you got to see something out there. We have incentives for businesses to install infrastructure. We also have the other programs like the one CalStart is doing to get cars in their hands and at no cost and let people try the cars out. Um, in fact, I've heard that 80% of the people have never tried an electric vehicle. You're certainly not going to buy one if you never tried one. So let's get it in the hands of people's car, get them behind the wheel, and get them trying the cars. And that's what these programs are designed to do. That's the value of the program, that the customer doesn't have to invest or, or put a lot of money, you know, in order to put that infrastructure in their facilities. That's what's exciting about today with this press conference is this opportunity for all of the community, businesses, residential, hopefully apartment complexes to install EV chargers and promote the concept of let's reduce fossil fuel use and promote electric vehicles. With those rebates that they're promoting, we could do approximately 30 sites with a rebate up to $50,000. That could be a really great opportunity for the district to bring in electric vehicle charging stations for our employees and our students and our families. We need to start driving down emissions. One of the best ways we can do that is through the accelerated use and deployment of electric vehicles. We need to get more people in electric cars. It is, it is really critical. The challenge here in California is that despite all of our great programs, all the incentives, gasoline demand has been rising in the state for the last six years. They're here to join us today because the collaboration in our community is helping to make Pasadena successful with our EV efforts. We want consumers to know that today, buying or leasing an electric vehicle is more affordable than ever. Pasadena introduced last month, Pasadena Water and Power introduced a slew of incentives. We are a city committed to do our part in reducing our carbon footprint. So great things are definitely on the horizon.
The Adaptive Art Program is a program that is designed for adults with disabilities to have a chance to create and have a free reign of their imagination and their talent. This is their chance to be free of their disabilities. In fact, if anything, it is a chance in which they enhance their disabilities to show their uniqueness and to show their e innate creativity and sometimes they chance upon things that are quite brilliant in a, w which you wouldn't imagine they would have uh, because it's art and art is a place of freedom. The adaptive art program is important because it is accessible. There are so many people in the community of Pasadena that have disabilities but don't have access to affordable recreation. The program has helped me get over a lot of, a lot, a lot of personal issues. It just makes me feel, feel myself when I'm doing my artwork and I feel like I have a voice and I'm very detailed as you can see from the picture. I like to like do de detail work. I'm a, very, I'm a very shy person. I actually found my voice in artwork. Yeah, I've been coming to art class for five, five years. Sometimes it's hard for me to draw. I ask somebody to help me. That's what I need to learn, to do my own. And I ask somebody. The reason why this program and this exhibition is so important is because it's already a big deal for an artist to see their work in a gallery, but the gratitude and the, um, the feeling that specifically our artists get and the pride that they're able to display is unmeasurable. And they learn a lot to be around with people that are supposed to be normal. <laughs> they feel like they belong somewhere. That's the whole thing. They belong somewhere. I got the pride with the mayor. I got the roof even. And they all proud of me that how good I'm doing up there. It make me feel happy, make me feel smile. That make me feel good. That's what I like. I like it when uh, people come in and want to see um, us do our artwork. There was this uh, one soccer mom whose child was doing soccer over on the other side and she wanted to see it and then she was so impressed she got her son to come over and see the artwork and she was really proud and happy of all of us. My artwork was like hanging up on the top, the top part of the, of the room. It's called The Monkey and the Fish. Everybody liked it so much that they kept coming up to me and saying that I did a good job on my artwork and I was just like nervous about the whole, the whole day. The mayor liked my picture so much, he gave me the, the blue ribbon. It was something that I never got before, so it was like really, it made me proud to, to, to like be, a, be an artist. It takes one to teach one. I have a natural proclivity for it because I didn't know how to read till I was 11. And I was considered DDL in the 1950s before they understood dyslexia. And that's why I got into it. Jane, he's a good teacher. He do nice for me. He teach me how to draw pictures, and I love him. And I'm gonna miss him. And I'm gonna feel sad that he's leaving. There's not a lot of programs for disabled adults, and I'm so glad to be with Maria and Jane, because if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be doing the art that I have done. And it might be hard, Everybody in this class loves them very much, and I'm sure everybody in the class wants to wish them the best. On behalf of all the staff and volunteer members of the Terman of Roses, I would like to welcome you all to the Terman House for the official announcement of the 2019 Royal Court. Nineteen oh five, if you can believe it, was an interesting year. It was the start of the Russian Revolution. Both Joan Crawford and Howard Hughes were born in nineteen oh five. Einstein developed E M C squared. That's all well and good, but here in Pasadena, we celebrate nineteen oh five for a completely different reason. 
It was during that year that we crowned our very first Rose Queen, Hallie Woods. These are our future leaders that are here today. And I want to express my thanks to the staff of the Tournament of Roses for all their hard work in selecting such an exemplary and outstanding choices. The theme for the 130th Rose Parade is the melody of life this year. It celebrates music, the universal language by which we all communicate. A lot of you know I've gone through a lot of medical and the music has just been there strong to help me get through a lot of stuff. And, and that's how we chose the theme. But I also wanted music because it's something that is, is universal again. And if you look at our poster, it has a globe on it. It's universal and it goes worldwide and it reflects all of us. And the one main thing that we wanted to do was bring us all together because here at the Tournament of Roses, we are a family and that's what we believe in. But hey, we are here today to pick the seven finalists and that's what I'm here to do. So the 2019 Royal Court, Craig, may I have the first envelope, please? Number 203, Ashley Hackett. From Sequoia High School, Louise Sisko. We're from San Marino High School, Sherry Ma. From Westridge School, Michaela McHale Rapp. from Westridge School, Lauren Badalon. Number 78 from La Cunada High School, Lucha Kadam. Number 59 from Flint Ridge Preparatory School, Helen Rossi. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present to you the 2019 Tournament of Roses Royal Court. I personally was just kind of shocked um, to be chosen and I think, I think they saw something in me that maybe I can represent the Rose Court in the best way and I'm really excited to start this journey. All of these finalists are so amazing. They are such amazing and strong girls and I can't even believe that this opportunity has been given to me. and I've. I'm honored to be on this court. Um, I have grown up, I guess, public speaking and doing different talks and everything like that. And those are aspects of my life that I've grown up from my dad and I'm very proud of. And I think that that serves as an important component to it that I hope that I can emulate and I hope I can work on. I love community service and that's something I'm very passionate about. And so I'm hoping that I can continue that on the Royal Court. 